for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Wednesday afternoon, December the 28th, 1977. Winter camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. This tape is with Brother Wynn Worley. If you, have your, if you have your Bibles, would you turn please to the book of Second Timothy, the first chapter and the seventh verse, and let's do that for God has not given us a spirit of fear first, okay? Is this wrong? This one gets in my way. Uh, I don't know about that, that one. The other one's going to see. For God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and sound mind. For God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and sound mind. For God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and sound mind. For God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and sound mind. Let's sing it a couple more times. You've just about got it down now. Uh, Look up and let her fly. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Second Timothy, uh, one seven. Did I not give the right reference? Maybe that's what you were looking at. You got strange. <laughs> well, I knew what it was, so I didn't have to look it up. See. <laughs> Let's try it again. Come on. For God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and sound mind. God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and sound mind. Once more, for God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and sound mind. For God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of mind. I believe the Lord would have me speak this afternoon on loosing the spirits of God. This is a thing that came to me, and I never read it anywhere, and just before the manuscript for Conquering the Host of Hell went to the printer, uh, I rushed down to the office and put in a little section, if you've got the book, called The Spirits of God. I tripped across something that tripped something in my mind, and I began to go to the Scripture to look and see about the Spirits of God, and I opened up something that, to me, was the most breathtaking thing I've found since seven years I've been in deliverance. I believe this is the key to breakthrough. I don't even know how to use all that this implies yet. And I... I um, was so excited about it when I got it I could hardly wait to get to the church and preach about it and I I preached about it and uh, my people picked it up enthusiastically and began not only to bind evil spirits but to loose God's spirits and, and things really picked up business picked up in a hurry and it was a beautiful thing to me because of the fact that uh, to me it was the key to getting the armies of heaven into this savage conflict that we're in. Now, we've asked for angels, and the Lord has sent them, but this puts them in the battle on a wholesale scale and specifically, and you can call in specialists in certain areas. Uh, and I hope I can challenge you and stimulate your brain wheels and send you to your concordances, because that's what I did. I went to the concordance, 
And I had always, well, Matthew 18, 18, let's start there. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, when we first started in deliverance, uh, some of you heard me speak, and you know that when we first started in deliverance, we didn't know how to quit. I mean, if we got a demon on the string, we had to just stay with him until he came out. There was no way we could stop, because we didn't know how to bind spirits. Nobody ever told us. And so uh, all we knew how to do was attack and fight to the finish. And uh, this worked very well, but it sure was wearing and tearing on the workers and on the poor person that was being delivered sometimes. If you finished up at 5 in the morning particularly, you know, and had to get up and go to work at 7. And um, so we were so thrilled when we uh, found out that you could bind these things and cut things off and stop it in order for the workers and the person that was being delivered to get some rest and recuperation and so forth. But, you know, I, was, I, I never thought too much about it, but I noticed that, that whatever you loose on earth should be loosed in heaven. And I thought, well, I think binding's fine, but I'm not too interested in loosing those critters. I'd rather see them tied up than unloosed, you know. I'm not particularly interested. I don't know. You know, it's one of those things you think, well, that's nice. You know, I'm glad you put that in there, Lord. I don't have any idea what it means, but, you know, it's, I believe it. And, but I'm not uh, interested in loosing anything I know about. The things I know about, I like to bind rather than to loose. So it rocked along, and I don't know why. It, it's strange, isn't it, that we, we know these things, and yet we don't know them. And all of a sudden, the Lord shows us where they fit. Turn to 1 John chapter 4, 1 John 4, 1. 1 John used to, when I was a baby Christian, 1 John became one of my favorite books. So I know I knew this scripture, and I'd read it dozens of times, and even read it since I've been in deliverance, and had used it in preaching. But it never did lock in what it meant until this thing about the spirits of God came rolling in. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out of the world. Now, maybe everybody else in the Christian world knew it, but I never did. it never did dawn on me. When I thought of spirits, I thought of evil spirits, and then, of course, I knew about the Holy Spirit. But this says that they, you try the spirits to see whether they be of God. Well, if they're all evil, you don't have to try them if it's a spirit's evil. But John says, try the spirits, check them out, to see if they are spirits from God or spirits from the enemy. And I thought, well, hello, dummy. Why didn't you realize that a long time ago? It's staring you right in the face, you know. That's what he said. There are spirits of God. Now, I'd read about the seven spirits over in the book of Revelation, mentioned, I think, four different times. The seven spirits of God before the throne of God. And I went to seminary, and, and uh, I was interested to know what they'd say about that, because it kind of puzzled me. I couldn't see the Holy Spirit subdivided. I mean, you know, to me, the Holy Spirit was the Holy Spirit, the whole thing. And by the way, I don't think you get a piece of him either. I think he comes in a whole parcel. I don't think you, you chip him up. Uh, but, and, and, but it kind of bothered me, and so uh, in seminary, I think one of our teachers said, well, the seven, you know, is the number of God, it's the number of completeness, and, well, that did about as well as anything. It wasn't too satisfactory, but I didn't know anything better. So I thought, well, that's nice, but I still wonder why God had to say it like that to kind of make it difficult to get around. Why seven spirits? But I just let it lay. And then, of course, over in Isaiah, there's a passage, what is it, the 11th chapter of Isaiah, about verse 2, talks about the spirits of God, and there's seven of them there. And... One of these bird dogs in my church came up when they got to chasing scriptures on the, uh, I think all of them got a Young's or a Strong's concordance. They go checking. When they go checking, they check deep. And they find them all. They find a lot of them that I miss. And uh, one of them came up to me and said, Brother Verley, said, I've been praying about the spirits of God. And said, I believe that every spirit that God has will categorize under one of those seven in Isaiah. And I believe that's why they're mentioned as the seven spirits. They must be the, 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 the head domos over the, all the spirits of God. And so I, I'll just throw that out for you, and you, maybe you want to take it and check it out and see if you can drop them in slots underneath there. Now, you know, the amazing thing to me was that I decided I would check and see further. Well, I, I remembered something about uh, over in Hebrews. I got to run in references on spirits, and I ran right into Hebrews chapter 1. Go there, please. Hebrews 1, 7, And of his angels, he saith, who makes his angels spirits. There it is. And how many times had I read that and it never clicked? 
God makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Then I drop down to verse 14. Are they, speaking of the angels, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? I said, Hallelujah, that's me. I'm one of those heirs. Did you know I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ? And they'll never take away my inheritance in probate court either. Because I'll tell you, we are heirs of salvation. Now notice, these ministering spirits are sent forth to minister for whom? Those who shall be the heirs of salvation. Are you beginning to catch? Can I see the? I see that sparkle coming in people's eyes. They're getting the scent. You're getting the scent, aren't you? This is opening up a whole new thing if you hadn't thought about it. Well, I got so excited, for, and then I thought, oh boy. Well, if they're if they're spirits of God, I wonder if their names are in there. So I got my concordance, and I began to run. And lo and behold, I found a hatful of them. I found over fifty. You'll find them listed in Conquering the Host of Hell. I uh, just listing the references of some I found. And I, I picked out all the good ones. Now, as usual, some of those smart aleck kids in my church, they, uh, one of them, uh, I preached on it on Thursday night. Now, he couldn't wait to be nice. He had to run right home, and he started digging. So by Sunday, he had run up with a whole list. He had a whole list in the back of his Bible. He had them all written down, all the spirits of God he found. And then he was dealing with a demon. He was leading an attack over here, several workers, and he was the one that was in, uh, he was in the head of the thing, and they were after that thing. I was working on the other side of the church, and I heard that thing as an awful stubborn cuss, and it just kept saying, no, 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 just leave me alone, I'm not coming out, and it was very determined. <laughs> Sounded like it meant what it said. And uh, so after, but just in a little while, I heard the most awful scream, ear-splitting scream, and this demon said, no, no, why did you have to do that? Oh, why did you do that? Now I have to go. And they began to cuss him, you know. Now that got my interest. When they start singing my song, I just have to go over and listen a little closer, you know. And so I walked over and I said, Dennis, what in thunder did you do to that thing? And he started laughing. He said, well, you know, said you preached on... Loosen the spirits of God Thursday night, and I went home and got a big list of them, and said, so when I was reading through, I found a spirit of destruction, and a spirit of judgment, and a spirit of burning, and I just loosed those on him. <laughs> I felt like telling him, shut your mouth, child. I'd have thought of that if I'd have started studying about it a little bit. Because, you see, I was looking for all the good ones when I was looking. Because, you know, I didn't think about God doing something ugly. And, and, uh, and it never occurred to me to do what that kid did. But I tell you, I, I've got to go back and revise my list now and, uh, and include some of those nasty things I found listed as spirits. And, you know, that fits, too, because you remember there's a reference in the Bible where it said God sent an evil spirit out to do something. By the way, he can command the evil spirits, too. You know, he doesn't just command the ones that are officially under his command. He can also command the others. If you don't believe it, watch some believer who has the authority of Jesus command them. We can do anything Jesus says we can do, can't we? And I'll tell you, I don't know, I'll say again, I don't know how to use all this. It's like uh, having 500 men in your army, and then all of a sudden, receiving notification that there are five million reserves, troops, waiting. All you have to do is send for them. And they're better armed than the troops you've already got. That's the armies of heaven we're talking about, friend. This is how we're going to break the devil's back. This is how it's going to come. When we learn how to use our authority. Now, let me say this. Because it's always misunderstood. And somebody's going to grab hold up and run off. Whirly's worshiping angels. Whirly's praying to angels. I knew he'd get off. You know, people get off deliverance. You know, they always get off. Well, you will if you don't stay tuned with the Lord. There's no doubt about that. But you'll get off if you go over here of the glory boys, too, if you're not careful. And not in a safe place to be except right in the center of God's will. And His will. What we need to do is understand we never pray to angels. We never address them in prayer. Never. They are ministering spirits. They are not to be prayed to. We pray to the Father, to send those ministering spirits to do their job. And you know what will happen? He'll send them. 
and they'll do their job. One time in history, a long time ago, well, I'd, I'd known about the angels would intervene in this battle if you called for them. And I got in a lot of hot water about that. Of course, it didn't bother me too much because uh, the people that were upset about it weren't getting demons out, and we were, so I figured we, were, we had the best on our side. Uh, but I learned early in this ministry to call for the Lord to send angels in to put the pressure on the evil spirits that were in the person. And I remember in Houston I had one cornered, and he was a pretty powerful prince, and I couldn't dislodge him, so I was uh, squeezing him for all the information I could get to tear up his kingdom. Well, he, didn't, he didn't like it too much, you know, I mean, he wasn't too enthusiastic about what was going on, but there wasn't a whole lot he could do. Because I had an angel, I had the Lord send an angel and bind him up and stand there with a sword. And every time he lied to me, I'd ask the angel to poke him with a sword if he lied. And I'd, uh, I'd make him tell me who was in there, and I'd say, how many are? Then he'd say, 15. Then there'd be a horrible scream. And I said, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't lie. And then he'd cuss and talk about that angel with that blankety-blank sword. <laughs> and I got to where I rather enjoyed it. I kind of looked forward to him lying. <laughs> because, boy, every time he did, that angel was just as, he was on the job. And finally, I pinned him up and I said, Now, how many did you say there was? He tried lying three times. And each time, that angel gigged him. And he screamed. And I said, Now, you better tell the truth this time. I was very sweet and understanding. I could afford to be. I had him on the ground, boy. And I was treading him underfoot. That's a good position to be in. You know that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you, by the way, if you hadn't heard me before, I have to confess that I thoroughly enjoy what I'm doing. Don't feel sorry for me because I, I just enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, but uh, anyway, this thing, finally I got him to the place and, uh, and he, he told me a number, 25 or 30 spirits of a certain kind. I was trying to find out. So I want to get all of them out. And uh, I said, is that the truth, angel? The demon glared at me and said, yes, that's the truth, Worley. So what the angel's doing? said, he's standing there grinning with that stupid sword. He just dying to get at me again. You see, I found out that the angel just loved to get involved in this. But I never thought about just whole legions of them that could come in. I, like I said, I don't know all that's impl implied in this yet. But we're learning, and what we're learning is helping a tremendous amount. And this will work in many situations, not just in deliverance. This will work in other situations. I mentioned to you the other day about an old church, uh, a large church in Toronto, Canada. I was in a home meeting there, and a young, uh, an older Dutch couple where I stayed were very concerned because they felt that their church had been swept by a spirit of deception. And their pastor and his wife were fine people, Bible-believing people. They had drifted from the Word of God, from dependence on strictly the Word of God, and they drifted over into some all kinds of stuff where the devil can operate real freely. I won't even go into details, but you know what I'm talking about. I call it the charismatic mishmash. And they drifted off, and everybody was having a time, and nobody seemed to realize they were getting away from the bedrock. And if you get away from the place where your anchor is, you're pretty soon going to be in water over your head, and then the devil will torpedo you, and you won't have any foundation under you. So anyway, they were concerned, and yet they wouldn't, they had never talked to anybody about it except me. They talked to each other and the Lord, and they prayed, and nothing seemed to happen. Their children were in the church, and, and it was a good church in many ways. But they just felt there was a drifting there. They said, Pastor, they said, what can we do? Well, I suggested that they start binding the spirits of deception and the spirits of shallowness and the spirits of a lack of conviction about the Word of God and some other things like that, and begin to loose on that church spirits of truth, spirits of of conviction of the Holy Spirit, of sin, righteousness, and judgment, to bring those people back to even keel. And the, uh, all the opposite, the, the spirits they felt were lacking in there, to loose those spirits from God, and to do it every day. But I want you to know those Dutch folks, they got on the job. Two months later, I got a letter from them. And this man was rejoicing. He said, Brother Worley, I just had to let you know. He said, Tobe and I, every morning and every night, we have been binding those evil spirits we thought were hindering our church fellowship, and we've been loosing the spirits of God that God revealed to us would be needful. We looked them up and picked out the ones we thought were the best ones, and we loosed those on that church and said, it is absolutely unreal what is happening in our church. Now, this is a congregation of maybe 2,000 people. They don't know anything about this two, these two people 
But these two people have got a leverage. They've got a crowbar on that whole thing, and they're lifting up. They're putting leverage on it. Two people against 2,000 who don't see any need for a change. Now, these two, and he said, Brother Morley, he said, the people are in the testimonies before they were so proud and, oh, I'm just doing great and this, and said all of a sudden things have changed and people are standing saying, I want you to pray for me. The Lord has really been dealing with me. I feel that I'm not as close to the Lord as I used to be. I need to get back to the Word of God. I need to get back to praying. Two people. And then their own daughter and her friend came in from nursing school. They went to the same congregation. And the daughter said, Dad, we've been talking about it. We don't feel as close to the Lord as we ought to be. Now, that dear couple never shouted because they, you know, you're concerned about other people, but you're really concerned about your young ones. And sure enough, they said, well, they were hesitant. They didn't know whether these kids could take that or not. But they followed the Lord, and they opened up and shared what they had been doing. These kids fell into it, said, oh, let us copy down that list. And now there's four of them binding and loosing. Isn't that great? Doesn't that encourage you? And here you thought you had to have half the church on your side before you could do anything. Huh? You see, we've got power we have not tapped. And either, uh, I believe Brother Ferris uh, mentioned about God working through the few. And he does. He's never had the majority. Did you know that? Go back to Mount Carmel. One man against the whole shooting match. And when the fire fell... Jezebel's host went into a state of shock, and while they were shocked, Elijah cut their heads off. Now, like I said, I don't really know how many spirits of God there are, but there's a bunch of them. Now, let me say this. We know that there are multiplied thousands of evil spirits of various categories and shapes and sizes. I have a list of 1,300. We gave their names before I started keeping their names at the list about three years ago. Then plus, in the new book, I ran down and, and uh, references on... A whole bunch of them that are named in the scriptures of bad things that are spirits, definitely called spirits in the scriptures. Now, I reason this. God has two-thirds of the heavenly host standing with him. See, there were three, three archangels in the beginning. There was Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. And Michael seems to be associated particularly with God the Father. Because of the Father's relationship with Israel, you'll find Michael as standing at the great champion of Israel. Because she's said to be the bride of Jehovah, or the wife of Jehovah, excuse me. Then you move on and you find Gabriel. You know, of course you know who he is. He toots that final horn. Well, who, who gives out the news down here? The Holy Spirit. Guess who Lucifer was tagged with? Jesus, the Son, the Eternal Son. And he's the one who rose up in rebellion, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and said, I will be like. One reason that Lucifer is so beautiful and so covered with glory. Now, his every precious stone is his covering. Tabrets and pipes were built into him. He was a living song of praise to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you see, the Son has always had a place in the Father's heart. And I believe the most beautiful, the most powerful archangel was Lucifer. Because I find that when Moses, this dispute over Moses' body came up, an archangel was the one sent to handle it, and he didn't dare hit Lucifer head on. He said, the Lord rebuke you. I remember that when Lucifer came as the prince of Persia, he interfered with the answer of a prayer Daniel made for 40 days. He held off the answer. And they went back to the third heaven and got reinforcements and got direct orders from God to go right on through. We're dealing with the super angel, Lucifer. But he sure has taken a fall. And you know something? He's going to fall even lower as the clods of dirt all over this earth who've been redeemed and sanctified by the blood of Jesus take up the cry, let's crush him, let's get him. Because they have been given authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. We've been given authority to tear down the walls of those prison houses. Let me mention some of the spirits of God. Now, some of them are not mentioned as spirits either. Let me caution you about that. One reason I wanted to sing that little song. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's an evil spirit. There is a spirit of the fear of the Lord, but that's not the evil spirit. The evil spirit of fear makes you terrified and paralyzes you and and keeps you in terror. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is clean. 
Now, the fear of the Lord came over this place last night, if you were here. That's when the Holy Spirit was just sweeping so close to you. You just almost want to hold your breath, you know, for fear you just break something God was doing. And you, you know. Now, that's the fear of the Lord. It's a holy reverence in which people's hearts just open and their spirits just worship without them even thinking about it. They just, it just pours out of them because uh, of the fear of the Lord in the place. That's the fear of the Lord. And it's clean. That's refreshing. It's upbuilding. It's edifying. The other kind is the kind that drives you to the mental hospital. Now, but he said that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, of power, love, and a sound mind. Now, you notice that that's not, they're not mentioned as spirits, but in the English grammatical construction, you just don't repeat. What that really means is, God has not given to us the evil spirit of fear, but he has given to us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, a spirit of a sound mind. By the way, God's spirits are more powerful than the devil's. That's an interesting thing, too. You see, everything the devil has is a counterfeit of the real thing, because he can't create anything. All he does is copy and duplicate. He runs a duplicating process. Everything he runs out, that's the reason once you trip on how he operates, you've got his number. He doesn't have just a few patterns. He only has three highways he travels on. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those are his three main superhighways. And just about all of his stuff is variations on those things. And once you trip to his patterns, he doesn't have 10,000 ways to work. He has just a very few. And if you begin to read the Word of God and find out what he is, in 2 Corinthians, for instance, the book that was written to expose the works of Satan, Paul said, I'm writing this because I would not have you to be ignorant of the way Satan works. And he proceeds to unveil the way Satan is working inside the Corinthian church. And God will give us information about this super creature in order to fight him successfully. The spirits of God are, can be infinitely powerful from God. And I reason that because only, what was it, two angels, I believe it took to roll the stone away from the tomb, and we've had demons cry and tell us that the whole host of the demons and Satan himself were trying to hold that rock in place. And one of the demons, I said, well, he said, I said, what happened? He said, you know. And I said, well, I want you to tell me. He said, well, the stone was rolled away. I said, who did it? He said, the angels. I said, how many? He said, only two, and we tried so hard. I said, all of you? He said, yes, everybody tried. Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> the whole host of the demon host were concentrated at that tomb to hold that lid on. And two angels commissioned from God came and shoved it out just like there wasn't anything there. You see what I'm talking about? We've got resources. We have news. We've got reinforcements. We've got troops that can smash the enemy, and they're just dying to get into this. They're just dying to turn the thing. And this is how it's going to turn people. It's not going to turn because we're so smart or because we're so great. It's going to turn because we realize we can't do anything, and we turn in dependence to our Heavenly Father and say, Father, we're besieged down here. And we learn how to loose these spirits. And everywhere this message has been preached so far, and people have begun to loose spirits, it is radical and beautiful what is happening for the glory of God. Now let me mention some. Power, love, and some are not called spirits, so you won't find them in your concordance. You'll find a lot of them. You'll, have, you'll find over 50 spirits that I have classified as more or less in the good category when I was first running them down. You'll find over 50 of them. And then if you go and include things that I didn't include, like destruction, judgment, and burning, which come in handy in dealing with demons, you know. Uh, uh, they <laughs> well, now, I'd have thought of that if that kid hadn't found it out. You know. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful to have people, though, that will just come up and share? And my books are full of things that the kids have brought to me. Did you know that? Oh, listen, don't ever get so big and high and mighty that you know it all. My land's a living. Every shred of information I can get that'll that'll put the pressure on the enemy, I just enjoy putting it into practice. I pass it on to everybody. Now, you'll find some, though, that are called spirits. Let me just call off a whole raft of them here. And they're listed in the back of Conquering Those to Hell if you want, or you got them in your concordance if you want to get them. The, there's a spirit of Jacob. I don't know whether you'd want him or not. You might all think before you released him. But anyway, there is a spirit of Jacob. 
There's a spirit of wisdom. Boy, wouldn't that be great? Amen. By the way, you can lose these spirits on yourself as well as on somebody else. Do you ever feel stupid and dumb? How about asking the Lord to lose the spirit of wisdom on you? Don't you? He said they're ministering spirits for the, those who are the heirs of salvation, didn't he? Is he telling the truth or is he just kind of making conversation? That's true. There's a good spirit. Do you ever have a sour spirit? Get mad at the Lord, you know, and get all pouty and puffy. Thank you very much, Lord. Appreciate that. You gave him the blessing. You didn't give me none. Let him preach. You didn't let me preach. <laughs> let him witness. I didn't get to. Do you ever have a bad spirit? Well, if you can't dislodge him any other way, try loosing a good spirit from the Lord. You say, well, will that work? Yeah, you know, this is a funny thing, because I've been dabbling around this thing for a long time and never did fall into it. It's a thousand wonders I didn't find out about it sooner because I remember there were a couple of fellows who were sent to us, Basham, Don Basham sent a couple of fellows down from Milwaukee to see us one time to get some help. They'd written to him and he told them to go down to Chicago. And they came in, and these two precious boys, they were, they were young black men, and they both called to preach, real precious boys. They were, they were brothers, uh, real brothers. And then they both called to preach, and they'd been off to some church, and had their hands laid on, and they got all the false gifts. And they were loaded. And they knew they were wrong. I mean, you know, if you start praying in tongues and you get sexually aroused, there's something wrong. And they, and, and when they'd exercise any of these so-called gifts they had, they'd become depressed or they'd become, they'd be filled with evil instead of good. So they just shut down. They knew there was something bad wrong. And they couldn't shake it and they couldn't find anybody else. And they found, they read Rashom's book, There Was Some Evil, and so they wrote to him. And he referred them to us, and they came down. Well, we, go, we first went through cleaning house. That was the first step, to clean out every, all the mess and the garbage that the devil had managed to put on them. Because they were innocent. They were, they were sweet, lovely Christians. They went, and these people said, oh, you need these gifts. And they thought, well, these are people of God. And probably the people put it on didn't even know they were witches and warlocks, but that's what happened. You be careful who lays hands on you. Spirits can transfer that way. Just be, you don't have to live in fear, but I mean... Uh, I tell you, a good thing to do is just cover yourself with the blood. Anytime you go, say, Lord, I want you to cover me, my mind, body, and spirit with blood before I go up here and have prayer. And if there's anything evil trying to get a hold of you, it won't be able to get through. Claim the protection. You've got it. You've got to protect. It's not automatic, though. You claim it. But anyway, these young fellows came, and we had not long, uh, the workers had worked quite a while with uh, one of the brothers and got him pretty well cleaned up and fixed up, and they got him the real baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he was happy as a lark. And the other boy, we'd gotten rid of everything except false tongues. And it was just bulldogging. I went over to see if I could help the workers. And they said, they said, Pastor, this thing just won't come out. I said, oh, yes, he will, too. That thing looked at me and said, I'm not coming out, Willie. And then he went to me, man, 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 man. I said, you shut up. He said, I don't have to. I'm not coming out. But I came in by the laying on of hands, and I'm staying. I said, well, I'm going to lay different hands on you. So we went to battle, and we wore, and we tried all kinds of kinks and corkscrews and everything else that we had found effective in other ways. And that thinking thing just wouldn't buzz. And here again, one of those smart other kids from the church. I'd have probably thought of it if he'd kept his mouth shut. <laughs> but he said, he said, Pastor Rowley, he said, why don't you try just put, he said, this boy wants the real baptism. He said, why don't you just put the real tongues in on top of that thing? And that demon jumped like he was shot and he said, you can't do that, Worley. You can't do that. Well, that convinced me you could. I said, well, it's worth a try. I said, come on, join me, workers. And boy, we laid hands on him. And that thing started screaming, no, no, don't do that. Oh, no, no, don't do that. Oh, please don't do that. And so we just, we just asked the Lord to baptize him the Holy Spirit. I said, Lord, you just take him right on. And that thing went to screaming and twisting and jumping. And when he got through, all of a sudden, that boy's mouth opened and a beautiful song in the Spirit came out. And he was floating. He didn't even know we were around. He just walking around. We couldn't talk to him. He wouldn't talk to us. He just he just go around singing, singing, singing. He wasn't paying no attention to nobody. About 15 minutes, we couldn't get him shut off. I mean, we want to know what happens, you know. We want to, and he wouldn't even talk to us. He just sang and sang and walking around. So I found out, you see. So that might give you some encouragement when you hit a stubborn one. Dump the opposite on top of them. May not always work, but it worked then. Praise the Lord. I tell you, uh, like brother, uh, my brother back here, brother John, I believe, uh, he mentioned the other night. You don't always do everything. He, he mentioned somebody got delivered by just lifting their hands and praising the Lord. 
You know, the people shrug and praise. And then he said, now I guess that's the way you deliver everybody. No, that's not. You don't fall into a stereotype mold. There are certain characteristics that are in common. But boy, I'll tell you, about the time you think you've got it pegged, it'll change on you. When we first got into this, we, we used to try to figure out who was going to have the violent deliverances and who was going to have the quiet ones, you know. So we could have our reserves accordingly, you know. Well, here comes some big weightlifter, you know. And he's been into all kinds of mess and everything. And I, I look around, I think I flagged several of my biggest boys, you know, five or six of them to get, to get ready. Because this is ready. And then he stands up there and yawns. I mean, you know, you think for crying out loud, he goes, you know. And then, then here, comes, here comes a lovely, very dignified, gray-headed lady, neatly dressed, very reserved looking. And she comes and you think, oh, well, this will be nice, you know. And you sit her down, you know, and maybe turn her over to one of the ladies, a couple of ladies, and say, this lady needs some help. Would you see if you could help her? And you turn your back, and in a minute there's an ungodly scream breaks out, and the bench sounds like it's kicking over. And you get over there, and those two ladies are wrestling, trying to hold that thing down. It's gone berserk. And you end up with six, eight men over there helping with this dear, reserved, dignified young lady, you know, that you've never dreamed was anything monstrous. So we gave up trying to categorize. They just don't fit any category. You just don't know. You just stand by and get ready and say, Lord, we're ready, whatever. But I would encourage you to get into this thing of loosing the Spirit of God. Good spirits. Un- spirit of understanding. Did you ever get mixed up and couldn't figure out something? There's a constraining spirit. Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. I have a feeling he might have had a constraining spirit from the Lord. That'd be a good one to have, wouldn't it? To constrain you to serve the Lord. And then he said, there's a guileless spirit. That's one that junks and throws overboard the seat. Remember Jesus said of Nathaniel, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. That was so unusual, even that day he mentioned it. And then there's a contrite spirit. David talks about that in the 51st Psalm. It's mentioned in several other places. Contrite means a broken-hearted spirit because of sin, because of failure with the Lord. And then there's a right spirit. Sometimes we get a contrary spirit in us, don't we? There's a right spirit. There's a free spirit. There's a broken spirit. What do you need a broken spirit for? Because we're so stubborn. And we can pray that God will send the broken spirit to us. That's broken before the Lord. Like the alabaster bottle, so the fragrance can pour out. You will never amount to anything until you're willing to be broken like that alabaster box. Remember this. The box can never be used for anything else. It's ruined. The ointment will never be able to gather it up again. The alabaster box is absolutely ruined by being broken. A broken spirit. There is a spirit of diligent searching. There's a faithful spirit. Do you have trouble being faithful? Maybe it'd be wise to loose a spirit of faithfulness on yourself or on somebody else. There's a spirit of humility. Are you having a terrible time with pride and who doesn't? My favorite story about pride is one time we were dealing with a lady and and this thing came to the surface and I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Pride. I said, well, hello, Pride. He looked at me and he said, well, I'm not just any Pride, Worley. I'm Big Pride. And I said, well, all right, Big Pride. And then we threw him out, you know. Next spirit manifest. I said, what's your name? He said, I'm Little Pride. Everybody needs me. And I said, we'll risk getting along without you. Watch out for Pride. It was the thing that tripped Lucifer and it'll trip you and me too if we're not careful. Spirit of humility is the opposite of that. An excellent spirit. Do you need an excellent spirit? Don't we all? There is a spirit of patience. Did you ever pray for patience? Oh, what a disaster that was, huh? Because you see, the thing that we don't understand is that God doesn't send the finished product. He sends the raw material. And the raw material out of which patience is made is all kinds of trouble. And you see, when the dump trucks backed up to our yard and started dumping, we say, hey, don't put that here. I didn't order that. And God said, oh, yeah, you did. I didn't order that mess. I ordered the finished product. And God said, oh, no, you take it and you make it. You make patience out of overcoming tribulation and trouble by dependence directly on God. There's no other way. Did you ever see this little sign that said, Lord, teach me patience and hurry? <laughs> There's a spirit of judgment. 
There's a spirit of counsel. When you're dealing with people, you need this spirit. There's a spirit of might. By the way, I suspect that if we went to the dictionary and looked up some of these words, we'd even get a broader idea of where some of these things can be used in our lives. I'm just giving you the bare outline that stimulates you to get you into the Bible. That's the most exciting thing in the world. See, Christians get excited about digging things out of the Bible. There's a spirit of might. Well, we need that, don't we? There's a spirit of knowledge. That will help overcome our stupidity, won't it? There's a spirit of the fear of the Lord. I've enjoyed releasing that on demons for a long time. There's a spirit of praise. There's a, there's a new spirit. Maybe you feel like yours is wore out. You need a new one. There's, there's one called a new spirit. There's a spirit of power. There's a willing spirit. That'll help overcome that stubborn, rebellious spirit. There's a ready spirit. There's a spirit of Elijah. Right after I tripped on this, I was someplace in a meeting. I don't remember where it was now. And some young fellow came up to me crying and put his head on my shoulder and said, Brother Warner said, Would you, I want you to pray for me to receive that kind of love that you've got. And I said, well, that's not hard to do, sure. Young preacher somewhere, I don't remember where he was. And I started praying for him, and I just loosed those spirits on him. And the Holy Spirit just started pouring into him. And then all of a sudden, the Lord said, I want you to loose another spirit on him. I said, what's that, Lord? He said, loose the spirit of Elijah. So I reached up, and I said, Father, I want you to release the spirit of Elijah on this young man. And when that thing hit him, he jumped. He said, what was that? I said, son, that was the spirit of Elijah. You better get ready. I think you and Jezebel are going to cross paths before long. And no reason for there to be an Elijah unless there's a Jezebel and her crew to be put down, is it? So there's a spirit of Elijah. There's a spirit of strength. Did you ever feel worn out? Dead tired? There's a spirit of worship. Can't worship. Just can't get into worship. Try asking the Lord to loose the spirit of worship. My church is all bound up. Can't get loose. Try loosening the spirits of worship on the people. That'll help loosen things up. There's a quickening spirit. That's a life-giving thing. There's a fervent spirit. That's where you get steamed up about the things of God. There's a spirit of adoption. That's the one you loose on your lost loved ones and friends. Adoption. Been adopted into the family of God. There's a spirit of adoption. If you, want to see, if you have lost people in a service, it'd be good for you to look around and say, Oh, praise the Lord, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so. And, and, and they've got their lost boy with them, or their lost girl. Loose the spirit of adoption and go to work on that lost person. Draw them to the Savior. There's a spirit of meekness. There's a spirit of quietness. There's a spirit of prayer. Spirit of singing. There's one called a life-giving spirit. There's a ministering spirit. Faith. Spirit of faith. There's a spirit of truth, spirit of prophecy, spirit of revelation, and on and on you could go. But that's just some of them that are definitely listed and called spirits in the Bible. And you realize what an impact it would make if you went back to your places and began to release spirits on yourself, on your fellowship? And you know, I believe that because the devil is sort of a cheap imitation of the real thing, that even though you may have a legion of spirits in somebody, it might not take a whole legion of God's spirits to hold them down or to check them or inhibit them or even defeat them because of the power of these tremendous spirits of God. If two angels could roll back the stone against all the assembled hosts of hell, hold it in place, then uh, we've, got, we've got lots to spare, haven't we? And doesn't that encourage you people really deep down inside? If you're like most people, this just sort of quickens you and you think, you think praise the Lord. I'm going to have to start doing that. Now, it won't do any good if you... Uh, it's just like I say about deliverance. Deliverance is not a panacea. It won't solve all your spiritual problems. It's not instant spirituality. If you're going to be delivered, you still have to pray. You're still going to have to read the Bible. You're still going to have to walk. Lord, you're going to have to fight with the old nature. Put it down. Crucify it. Walk daily with the Lord. It's not going to solve all your spiritual problems. But it will give you the chance to win. Now, loosing the spirits of God is not some easy way to win everything. It's not some place, oh, good, well, I can sit back in my easy chair and just loose all the spirits, and I won't do anything anymore. No, no, no. God always counts on his people being in the thick of the battle. These spirits will come and join in with you and work with you, these wonderful ministering spirits. Thank God. You know, I was, I, was, I was really excited about this. Right after the book went to press, before we even got it back to the printer, Norman Parrish came to our church. He called me and said he was coming 
I thought, wait, he wanted to stop by, and I said, sure, we've been wanting to see him. So he stayed a couple of days with us, and and I, when I got him, uh, the first time I saw him, I went up to him, I said, Norman, and I was still all excited about this. This is all brand new, and I was just, just all uh, bubbling about it because I was excited, my church was excited, we were just busy uh, loosing spirits all over the place and uh, binding up the evil ones and loosing the good ones and, and having a ball. And I said, Norman, tell me what you know about loosing, uh, about the spirits of God. He looked at me kind of funny and he said, what are you talking about, man? And I said, I'm talking about the angels of God, the ministering spirits of God. I said, I, everybody else may have known it, but I never read it anywhere and I never knew anything about it. But I said, I just found out you can lose those things and they're all over the Bible. They're full of The Bible's full of them. And you'd have to know Norman, but it just almost like tears in his eyes, almost. He looked at me and he said, when, Burley? Thank God. He said, I knew you were in this end time sweep. I said, that's just another confirmation. He said, because there's... That was revealed to us in Guatemala 12, 15 years ago when the Holy Spirit first fell. It came to us by revelation and said, the Lord said, seal it up. The church is not, the body cannot receive it yet. They're too carnal. They can't receive this truth. I said, boy, they better brace themselves because I said, there's 5,000 books rolling off the printing presses that's got it in there. It's fixing to hit. And I said, there's a bunch of people that are following the, uh, the deliverance work that we're doing, and when they pick up that book and read that, they're going to say, I'm going to try that. And I said, it's sure going to break loose whether they're ready or not. So they better get braced. Because I said, there's some, there's some fanatics that read those books. They, they try out what's in there, and it works. And he said, thank God, because the Lord told us, just seal it up. So we got accused of worshiping angels. We got accused of praying to angels and everything else. And we started doing this. And so we had to just close down and be very quiet and not say anything. And we prayed about it. And the Lord said, just seal it up. The body of Christ can't take it yet. They're not ready for it. And he said, that's just such a confirmation. Praise God. We're moving on. I said, if you, I said well, she's rolling off the print presses. It's going to be scared all over this country. Uh, and if they didn't know about losing the spirits of God before, they're going to know about it. And so I just praise the Lord. I believe we're getting ready for that glorious breakthrough. I believe there's going to be a smashing victory for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think he's going to be magnified in such a way that we'll think we never did even know him before. I mean, we're going to see the Lord do things we've never even dreamed possible. It's going to go way, way beyond our imagination. You know, the Scripture says, Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the imagination of man the things which God has prepared for him. You say, oh, yes, I remember that at Aunt Matilda's funeral, you know. That was so sweet. Talking about heaven. Well, now, heaven is like that, too, but that's not what that Scripture is talking about. That Scripture is right here on earth. It's talking about what God's going to do for His people right here. Now, I'll, I'll grant you that in heaven, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the imagination of man the things which God has prepared for him. I'm quite sure that's true. But that particular Scripture is talking about what God is going to do in and through His people right here on earth. It's not pie in the sky by and by. It's something for the nasty now and now. And that's what we need to do is to grab hold of every truth we can find that the Word of God will verify and use it. Now, I wouldn't give you a, a dime a cow pen full for all the theories, the religious and theological theories that won't produce but when it's based on the Word of God and you put it into practice and it works, I like that. I mean, you know, did you ever did you ever have to light a fire and you had a package of matches and you tried to strike them and they're wet and they wouldn't matter? You had a whole package, but they're all wet. And not one of them would strike fire. Well, I'd give you that whole package of wet ones for one that'd strike fire, wouldn't you? Now, there's a lot of people loaded with theological theories that are all dampened down. And they won't work. They won't strike fire. You can try them, and they'll just, you'll just get duller, and you'll get as dull as the people that wrote them. I believe God has something better than that for us. I'd rather have one string fiddle and play several tunes on it than have one with a lot of strings and not be able to play nothing, wouldn't you? Well, I believe that God has got something much better for us. Our business is to get ready for it. Did you know something? You don't have to go striving after it. The servant of the Lord shall not strive. Did you know that? You wouldn't know that sometimes the way you watch what's going on. 
My Bible, I catch myself every once in a while, you know, that striving spirit. Striving. Oh, I'm going to be spiritual. I'm going to pray. I'm going to succeed. I'm just so tired all the time. That worry you out. Well, the servant of the Lord shall not strive. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Now, the first part of that verse is real nice. You know, rest in the Lord. Isn't that sweet? Wait patiently for Him. Good lands. He waited 80 years to get Moses in gear. I may die before everything. everything's going to get done before I get there. It's not likely. One of the brothers was talking, I don't know if Brother Miller or one of the other preachers was talking about that God can do in three weeks what He used to do in 30 years. To, you don't have to worry about it. Matter of fact, we're not supposed to be worrying, are we? We're supposed to be trusting. Why worry when you can pray? And prayer can do anything God can do. And if you can't handle it, just tell the Lord about it and say, Okay, Lord, it's your baby. I've prayed about it. That's all I can do right now. So you show me something different, then I'm just going to eat with you. It's your problem now. I'm talking to myself, too. What a blessed thing it'll be when we learn how to get the armies of God really into this battlefield. I believe that's when we're going to see the tremendous breakthroughs. We're still going to have things that will tangle us up and break our pride. Because, you know, in spite of the best we do, don't you find pride rearing up in you every once in a while? I mean, you don't discuss it because that wouldn't be very religious. You know. But, uh, but you do catch yourself, you know, every once in a while with wrong attitudes or something. So that's a demon. Well, not necessarily. You've got an old nature that's just as rotten as any demon that ever was hatched. Demons just merely reinforce what the old nature wants. They'd never get a foothold. If they, listen, if they had to try to get a hold of that new nature, they couldn't. They can't even get a toehold there. That's that new man First John talks about where there's not anything going to get a hold of that. It's wrong. God, that came from God. And that's going to stay just like it is. And that's why, you know, that it's so silly for people to say the Christian can't have a demon because they have an old sin nature. And that's rotten as hell itself. And the Holy Spirit's living alongside that man. And the demons know they're, they're just as rotten as the old sin nature. And they, they, they root in that rotten manure pile over there, that's all. People say, well, I can't help it. I'm just human. Well, I wouldn't brag about it. God expects us to be superhumans, not in our own strength, but because we realize we don't have any strength. Not in our own wisdom, but because we realize we don't have any sense. We can't, we can't cope with the forces that are against us. But simply because we come in helpless dependence to Him and say, Lord, let the Holy Spirit completely control me so that I can cope. Calling the spirits of God into action will be a tremendous breakthrough for the body as the truth filters through and people begin to do it. It's like anything else. It works if you do it. Some people say, well, it didn't work for me. I said, well, are you doing it every day? Well, no. Well, now, if you didn't bathe every day, people would pretty soon know it without you even telling them. You know, there'd be a certain air about you. And if you're not, if you're not going to use these spiritual weapons and use these marching orders that God has given, they're not going to help you. You can know all about deliverance, but if you don't submit to it and go through it, you'll never get help for any spirits that are tormenting you. No matter how well it works, it won't work for you until you take hold of it. Same thing about the spirits of God. Same thing about the evil spirit. Praise God. Why don't we just stand? I look at have some music and there's somebody here who needs some kind of prayer, ministry, whatever. You'd be glad to try to help you. Maybe you just need counseling, maybe you need prayer, whatever you need. Why don't you come and let God help you? There are many people here. Brother Carol's here, Brother Miller, Brother Glenn. Many people would be glad to try to help you if you need help. You come on. And never push and pull in invitations. That's up to you. If you want help, come. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.